so glad you could join us this morning. Let's all stand together. We'll sing a song that's on the screen behind me. It's called Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. I'm sure you know it. Sing it out this morning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the rest.
your Bible with me to Psalm 76 this morning. Psalm 76. And we are going to read the whole chapter and just praise God for his goodness and his majesty. Psalm 76. Verse 1 says, In Judah is God known, his name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. There break he the arrows of the bow, the shield and the sword, and the battle. Selah. Thou art more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. The stout-hearted are spoiled. They have slept their sleep, and none of the men of might have found their hands. At thy rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariots and horse are cast into a dead sleep. Thou, even thou, art to be feared. And who mayest stand in thy sight whence once thou art angry? Thou didst cause judgment to be heard from heaven, and earth feared and was stilled, when God arose to judgment to save all the meek of the earth. Selah. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, the remainder of wrath shall thou restrain. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Let all that be around about him press presents unto him that ought to be feared. He shall cut off the spirit of princes. He, he is terrible to the kings of the earth. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. You may be seated. measured out my days, life carried me along, in my soul I yearned to follow God, but knew I'd never be so strong. I looked hard at this world to learn how heaven could be gained. Just to end where I began, where human effort is all in vain. Were it not for grace, I could tell you where I'd be, wandering down some pointless road to nowhere, with my salvation up to me, and I know how that would go. The battles I would face Forever running but losing the race Were it not for grace So here is all my praise Expressed with all Offered to a friend who took my place and ran a course I couldn't even start. And when he saw in full just how much his love would cost, he still went the final mile between me and heaven so I would not be lost were it not for grace I could tell you where I'd be wandering down some pointless road to nowhere with my salvation up to me and I know how that would go the battles I would face 
forever running but losing the race were it not for grace forever running but losing the race were it not for grace thankful that we again uh, we long for that day we look forward to that day but until then help us to be faithful and Lord I thank you for bringing us here today and and Lord as we lift our voices continuing this morning as we hear your word as we fellowship and give uh, Lord we are confident that uh, Lord as we fo- fix our attention on you uh, Lord that uh, you are going to be honored and glorified today and so Lord give us a wonderful day today in your house may it be a sweet day here Uh, lifting up our voices in praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, choir, ready?
Take your songbook once again. Turn to page number 589. Let's all stand together. We'll sing, Jesus is coming again. Sing it out this morning. Marvelous message. Marvelous message we bring. Glorious carol we sing.
wonderful singing this morning and love singing these songs about our Lord coming again and uh, what a wonderful truth to sing about. We're, we're so glad that you're with us today. I want to say a special thank you to those uh, who were able to come out yesterday and help with our work day. Uh, we got quite a bit done in spite of the, um, the muddy ground. Uh, we were able to get some things done. You notice the thing up there by the road and we'll, we'll see some more of that in the days ahead. But um, so thankful for all the work, so thank you for coming. I had the windows in here clean so you can see outside while I'm preaching, and uh, it's a beautiful thing. And so uh, Today you may. Today, today would be a good day to do that. You'll hear that in a little bit. But, uh, but we're so thankful for all of those who were able to help yesterday. Thank you for coming. And uh, about, um, I think, uh, 20 people finished off three dozen donuts. So uh, they're, uh, I think they'll stay awake today, so that'll be okay. But uh, if you're visiting today, thank you for being with us. You are our special guest. Thank you for coming. Uh, after the service, I'd love to meet you in the lobby in the back. My wife and I will be out there. Uh, also, if you could do us a favor and fill out that connection card in the pew in front of you, that'd be a wonderful help to know how we can pray for you and be an encouragement to you. I love getting those, and uh, it's such a blessing. So uh, also for our members, if there's something you'd like to pass along to us, uh, please do that through the connection card. Well, we also like to say a special thank you as we last week uh, began, really, our commitments for our journey of faith and uh, began really just taking a step of faith as we look forward to a building project and getting our parking lot and, uh, and all these things situated. And so there, it, it's one step at a time. So our journey of faith is what we're calling it. So thank you last week for your first week of commitments. If you committed to give weekly or monthly or annually, Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're looking forward to what God is going to do. So we'll have our men come forward for our morning tithes and offerings. This is a chance for us to give back a portion of what he has so richly blessed us with. And we are blessed. Uh, we're a blessed people. And let's pray for our offering this morning. Our Father, we come to you today. And Lord, again, we lift our voices to you and praise to you, thanking you for the gift of your Son. And Lord, today as we have an opportunity to give... Lord, we do know that it does pale in comparison to the greatest gift you gave. But Lord, this is simply an acknowledgement that all we have is from you. Everything we have is yours. And Lord, we want to acknowledge that today. And so Lord, as we give out of a cheerful heart, Lord, may the work of this ministry press on. May we continue to be faithful and discerning and wise as we seek to share the good news of Jesus Christ here in Goodrich and around the world. Lord, I pray for our missionaries today. I pray you'd strengthen them, bless them. Encourage them as they continue to serve and minister in, in various places around the world. Uh, Lord, give them your grace. Lord, be with this offering today. Use it for your honor and your glory here in Goodrich and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Thank you so much, guitars. I just remember, what was it, a couple years ago, there was maybe just two guitars playing. Now there's six. That's great. Praise the Lord. If you have a guitar, would like to play up here, bring it. <laughs> They'll set up another chair for you. So, uh, Take your songbook one last time. We'll sing on page number 513 if you need it. Speak, O Lord. Speak, O Lord. Yeah. 
Turn my, oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, that was on me. But I'd like to thank, by the way, our sound guys. A little before the service, our system crashed. And uh, it's been sort of seamless today, aside from my mistake. So I uh, appreciate that, guys. Thank you for all your work as they get us uh, live streamed and all those things. I appreciate everything that they do. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 2. As you're turning there, again, just a quick uh, reminder, we are looking forward as a church for our missions trip. Uh, we're going to Brazil this summer, Lord willing, to minister with our missionaries, the Pintos, in uh, Cuba, and uh, we're looking forward to that. We'll have a short stand-up meeting after the service. Uh, we won't be sitting down. It'll be that fast. And so if, you could, if you're planning on going or if you are uh, interested in going, today is really the, the final cutoff we need to know. So uh, looking forward to that, um, that just after the service. First Thessalonians chapter 2, let's have a word of prayer. And ask God to uh, calm our hearts, prepare our hearts for the truth he has for us today. Let's pray. Our Lord, we come to you today, uh, Lord, thanking you for, Lord, your word. Lord, we're so thankful that your word has, is truth, Lord, to live by, to guide our lives by. And Lord, Lord, that your word never fails and will never fail. Uh, Lord, we're, we are so thankful for that truth this morning. And Lord, as we consider Today, the Word of God, Lord, help us to be tender and open to what you have for us. Help us to view ourselves in light of your holy, perfect Word. And Lord, may we turn to you and rest in you, Lord, because of the surety of your Word. And so, Lord, we love you. We ask your blessing on these next few moments as we open your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we're beginning a series uh, I've entitled The Word of God. The Word of God. I think it's so important today that you and I understand the power of the Word of God and why it is important that we hold in our hands, we hold in our hands the most beloved book in the history of humanity, uh, the Word of God. And why that matters, I found myself the last few weeks telling folks uh, in church, outside of church, and those who reach out often, that uh, we, we believe that the, the Bible is our sole authority of faith and practice. All right? We look to the Bible. What does the Bible say? And I'm finding that more often than not, it is, it is uh, many people in churches, uh, so-called churches, uh, use just man's wisdom, man's thoughts, uh, man's, uh, man's ways of thinking, but here, of course, and I know many churches around the world use the Word of God as our authority, and that is where our case rests on the Word of God, and we know it to be true. It's a divine book. It's a holy book. It is the Word of God, and we yeah. rejoice in that today. Of course, as we consider the Word of God, you hold in your hand, of course, a wonderful uh, translation we have here in the English language. What a privilege, by the way, it is to have the Bible in English. Uh, you realize that. Uh, not every nation, not every uh, people group have the Bible in their language. We do know that God's Word was written over 1,500 year time by nearly 400 plus human authors that God used. Yet there is no discrepancy. There is full consistency and there is a united theme throughout the whole book, and that's the saving message of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful thing to consider. When I think also that the fact, uh, even today, kings have tried to destroy it. Nations have tried to ban it, but still it endures. Why is that? Because it is the very word of God. If they would only read the word, it tells us in Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Oh, if they only, if they only read those verses, they would know that any effort to destroy it or ban it is in vain. Because God made a promise in his word that it will never fail. You're in the book of 1 Thessalonians, a beautiful book. It's actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul and Timothy to the church at Thessalonica. Now again, there's going to be a lot of, I'll probably try to limit my saying of Thessalonians uh, to try to save those in the front row. 
uh, trying to trying to work up all the all the, everything to say it, but um, beautiful book. This was written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Thessalonica, and this is a beloved church, a church that he had known and loved, he had seen, he had been there, and this church was was really uh, one one of. Uh, one of the letters that he is just sharing his joy. He's trying to correct some things like many letters. He's encouraging the church to persevere in face of persecution they were experiencing. He, uh, as we study the book, uh, you look at the book, First Thessalonians, he's answering questions they may have had and may have been given to him, and he's really replying to them. He's also correcting many uh, false charges made against the enemies of the gospel to him, and they were, they were, they were falsely accusing Paul and he was correcting things and correcting errors. The end of the book, he gave instructions uh, and a promise to those who died before Christ returned. And uh, we know that you hear that those passages at funerals many times. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul gives them a word of admonition, a word of challenge, a word of blessing. He's thankful for them. And I'm going to read the first 13 verses of chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians. He says this, For yourselves, brethren, know that our entrance unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. In other words, they had just come there from Philippi when he was there with them. And he was, he was persecuted for the gospel, but that did not hit, stop him from proclaiming the gospel to those at Philippi as well. He says, for our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. He had, he had pure motives in giving them the gospel. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is, my, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others. When we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. In other words, he's saying, listen, I was honest to you. I was open to you. We shared the word of God in truth. He could have used his position as an apostle to gain a footing, to gain privileges, but he did not. Verse 7, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were very you were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Verse 10, ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believed. There were some that were accusing Paul of using the gospel and, the, and his platform for his own vain glory. But Paul is saying, no, I, we were genuine, we were, we were sincere. Verse 11, as ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. And verse 13 is our text for today. For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The Apostle Paul is sharing with this church at Thessalonica. He's sharing with them the joys of ministering with them, the honesty in which he did so. But he's also rejoicing that when they came to preach the gospel, that when they came to preach the word of God, that they did not receive it, verse 13, as the word of men, but as the very word of God. I don't think you and I will ever be the Christians God wants us to be until we come to the unshakable conviction that the Bible is the Word of God. God has given us His Word to follow, to believe, and to obey. It is His Word to man. And as we go through these next few weeks, I want to just really focus our attention on a couple elements of God's Word. Today we're going to be looking at the wonder of God's Word. The wonder of God's word. Of course, we, we have the word wonderful we use. Wonderful, full of joy and splendor and awe. 
And there is a wonder to be found in God's word. And let's consider some of those things today. He says in verse 13, For this cause we thank God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men. Number one, the word of God is not the word of men. <laughs> I'm so thankful this verse made it easy to, 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 uh, to outline. <laughs> The word of God is not the word of men. The word of God is divinely written for you and for me. Many people who are opposed to God's word say, well, it was written by man. Well, I think if you have any serious search about the evidence, they will find that there's something that sets God's word apart from all other books. From all other history that is given in this world today, there are, there are things that happened years ago that have no contention, no one disagrees with, with very little evidence. But yet God's word has over and abundant hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts, of writings, of, of, all, of all these things, and yet it is highly contested. Why? Because God's word rings true and speaks to the heart of man. But yet God, the word of God, is not the word of men. God, we didn't get God's word because some people thought they would just write some moral sayings and hope they would catch on. It is the word of God. Galatians 1, Paul says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, we're not going to dig into the whole, I, the whole uh, truth behind inspiration and preservation and translation and all these things. The word inspiration means it's God-breathed. God has given it to man. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 tells us all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God to man. So the, our, the Word of God is not simply men trying to sound smart. We have that before. That's why self-help books and all these things are a dime a dozen. Everyone wants to sound smart. Everyone wants to sound like they have a corner, they have a monopoly on wisdom. But yet, how is it that God's word has endured it all and is still the, 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 the benchmark by which everything is, is lined up against? 2 Peter 1, verse 20, Scripture says this, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. That means that the words given in Scripture was not a man in a room trying to sound smart. For the prophecy, the Word of God, came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. David perhaps says it best at the end of his life in 2 Samuel chapter 23. He says it very plainly. He says, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His word was in my tongue. That's what it means. It means that God divinely gave the word of God to those who He entrusted to write down for you and for me. It can be trusted. It can be believed. We can place our life on the word of God. And secondly, back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 13, it is not a word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, number two, the word of God is in truth, the word of God. There is no doubt about it. It is the word of God. You don't even have to look at the evidence. The Bible is self-authenticating. But if you were to look at the evidence, it is overwhelming, the evidence of the word of God. Matter of fact, I, I, I just mentioned the, the God's word is self-authenticating, which means the things in it prove it to be true. Everything it said would happen has happened. right? Everything it says about life is true of life. Matter of fact, go to Genesis chapter 1. You, you don't have to go there if you don't want. You may know these verses of chapter 1. The fact that the Bible is self-authenticating is found in simply the third verse of God's word. It says this. Verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then verse 3, which changes it all. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. 
The third verse in recorded scripture that we have speaks to us about the power of the word of God. He spoke and it was. Who can do that? Who does that? So often we say that maybe in jest. Uh, maybe we're, uh, we're working somewhere or maybe you're working in electrical and uh, you're trying to get light in your room and, and uh, you test it for the first time. And what do you say? Let there be light, right? We, we think, you know, that was us, but no. We know the source of that. But here in verse 3, God said, let there be light and there was light. What does that speak to? That speaks to the power and the creative power of the word of God. He sourced it, he secured it, and he sustains it. I thought of that this morning while I was praying over this. I thought, I gotta, he sourced it, he secured it, and he sustained it. He said it, and it was. That's the power of the word of God. God's word is so powerful that it begins to transform. It works, it transforms, it sanctifies, it reveals the heart of man. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us the word of God is quick and powerful or alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word has powerful ramifications. John 17, verse 17, in his prayer, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Everything he says is true. Everything God's word speaks about is true. Time and again, the Bible has been, I hate to say confirmed, as true. Anything you put up against it, it always comes out victorious. Because it is the word, the very word of God. We know this, that in God's word, God's word has been revealed to us in his son, Jesus Christ. John 1, verse 1 tells us, In the beginning was the Word. Sounds very similar to Genesis 1, doesn't it? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Skip down to verse 14 of John chapter 1. Scripture says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the Word of God revealed. That's what he is. He is the word of God revealed, who is, scripture tells us, the holy begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. God's word has been revealed in his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. He is the very word of God. I love what John says in chapter one. He says, we beheld his glory. We beheld it. We saw it. Perhaps he's speaking of the Mount of Transfiguration. Perhaps he's speaking of the many miracles they had seen Jesus do. But they had recognized that there was glory there in his words, full of grace and truth. I don't know about you, but sometimes there's times where I would have loved to have seen things in Bible times. I would have loved to have seen some of these events that took place, the parting of the Red Sea, Daniel and and the lions then. Oh, I I would have loved to see these things. And you may ask, man, if I could just get a glimpse of the glory, man, my life would change forever. Well, can I tell you today that you can? You can? Go to Psalm 19. You say, Pastor, where are you going with this? We're a Baptist church. You know this. We we (laughs) We have all these. What do you mean I can see his glory? Well, Psalm 19 tells me where it's found. You can get a glimpse of the glory of God. And I believe that next to the written word of God, creation speaks to the glory of God. Look at chapter 19 of Psalm. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God in his firmament, showeth his handiwork. I'm glad the windows were clean yesterday so you can look out while I'm preaching. The heavens declare it. What does it mean to declare? It means to shout forth. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiworks. It's on display. You see, well, that's nice nice that the the creation, you know, is there and we can look at it. But no, my friend, it goes further. Look at verse 2. Day unto day uttereth speech. And night unto night showeth knowledge. 
In other words, it shows that there's a creator. Verse 3, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Now, what does that mean? The idea, there's no speech, there's no words or language, there's no culture, there's no people group where the voice of God's creation is not heard. Suppose we were to have everybody in every church of our missionaries out in our field today looking at the beautiful green as it's growing, the buds that are, that are, that are coming, and we all could look and see the glory of God. Now, I'm surely that not all, not all of us would be able to speak the languages of our, of our missionaries' churches. But yet the nature of God, the creation of God, would speak to all of us without even words. Scripture calls it words. There's no speaker, speech or language where their voice is not heard. Verse 4, their line, their speech is gone out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. God's creation speaks to his glory. It declares his glory without saying a word. That's what his, his creation does. Ladies, you might know that uh, years ago there was a, a commercial for, uh, a, a, I think, a perfume, and, and uh, you could make a statement without saying a word. I think it was called exclamation, I think it was. Um, that's what God's creation does in the greatest way possible. It speaks to his wonder and his glory without saying a word. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. The glory of God. When I think of creation, I almost imagine, remember years ago when, and maybe you've seen it in, in movies or maybe in, in books, where someone would come to a village and they would have a proclamation from the king. And how would that always begin? Hear ye, hear ye. Right? Remember that? And then they would, they would say, by order of the king, or whatever they would say. And it's almost as if creation is saying, hear ye. Hear ye. There is a God in heaven. I think there's some elements sometimes in creation where God is, is clearly seen and his power is on display. Today, his beauty is on display. At night, his peace is on display. In the morning, his, his mercies are on display. In storms, his power is on display. And when I think even of this past week, last week we had a hear ye, hear ye moment, didn't we? Say, that's a sign. Yeah, it is a sign <laughs> that he is God and we are not. That we serve a God of divine order who made the heavens and the earth, whose word is not bound. I think of what took place last week, and I think of the words of 2 Timothy chapter 2 when the Apostle Paul said he was suffering trouble as an evildoer, even though he wasn't. He was in bonds. And then he says this phrase, but the word of God is not bound. The word of God is not bound. I can't help but think those nations and those kings who try to, to put away the word of God and destroy it and ban it are the same ones who experience his power in the storm and his peace in the sun and his mercy in the morning. God's word will never be silenced as long as there's creation. It is there for all of us to see. Back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, thirdly and lastly, not only is the word of God not the word of man, it is the word of God truly, but number three, the word of God was given to be received. It was given for you and me to be received. Look at verse 13. He says, because when ye receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. I don't know about you, but sometimes I stand amazed that the God of creation, the God of the universe, spoke words that I can comprehend. <laughs> you ever think of that? The God of the universe spoke words, spoke truth that I could comprehend, that I can understand. Why, why is that? How is that even possible? Well, I'll tell you, he's our creator. Who better to speak to the heart of man than the one who formed man's heart? Who better 
to speak to your heart than the one who formed you? Who better to understand your trials and difficulties and tendencies and, and all these things? Who better to do that than the one who formed you? He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're enduring. John 6, verse 63, Jesus says, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That's the power of the word of God. That's the power that we have when we receive the Word of God. The Spirit quickeneth. It makes alive the Word of God in our lives. It makes alive when we receive that. God's Word were given not for you to dissect and not for you to dismiss and not for you to argue. God's Word for, were given for you and for me to believe. And when we believe, God's Spirit dwells inside us. And when we believe, He giveth life. He makes new. I love the words of the song Philip Bliss wrote. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words. Wonderful words. Wonderful words of life. That is the word of God. I believe what Matthew Henry said, the more reverence we have for the Word of God, the more we stand in awe, the more joy we'll find in it. The more joy we will find in it because He has given us His Word for all things that pertain to life and godliness. He has given us His Word to rely on, to lean on, to trust in. Yet so often, the world tries to ignore it. The world tries to dismiss it. But as believers, I think now more than ever, we need people who are going to stand on the Word of God as the ultimate truth for us to live our lives by. The ultimate truth to follow, to listen to, to obey, to allow it to work in us. That's the power of the Word of God. Listen, if we serve a God who said, let there be and there was, if that's the God we serve, and it is, then every word He spoke and has preserved for us has that same power. It has that same power, the same author. And you and I can trust it, we can believe it, we can base our life on it. There is a wonder in the Word of God. There's a wonder about it. You think We sometimes lose the wonder. We fall into complacency of things that we, we know are always going to be there, the things that we know we've always had, and we fall into this trap of being complacent. You ever lost your refrigerator, your power to your refrigerator? You don't think about it until it's not there. <laughs> you ever lost your water pressure in your house or your water? You don't think about it until it's not there. Don't let that be like with the Word of God. Don't let that, don't let our peace and our prosperity lull us into losing the wonder of the Word of God. Something I tried to do recently, and it's still working on it, is trying not to complain about the weather. <laughs> That's hard sometimes, right? We have plans. We have plans. Last week I was a little frustrated because uh, I'm still working on it because Monday and Tuesday last week were beautiful, beautiful days. Um, and our daughter plays soccer, and um, of course no games those days. Uh, her games were Thursday and Friday. <laughs> and I thought, oh, man. Why is that? Why does that work that way? And it's hard not to complain. But can I, can I tell you that every time nature does something, God, the, the creation does something, it's just another display of the glory of God. It's another display that his word is still at work. And we can look at it and we can rejoice that we know the creator. We know the one who sustains it. And the word of God, there's a wonder. Let's not lose the wonder of the Word of God that you and I have in our hands. We have it. We have not, maybe, maybe you haven't valued it as much to think that, that this was compiled over 1,500 years. And we just, no, that's my Bible. But have you, have you lost the wonder that is this book? The very Word of God, the words that He spoke, they are spirit, they are life. Trust it, believe it, let it guide you. Let's pray this morning. Father, we come to you today. 
Again, so thankful for the Word of God. So thankful that you have given to us your Word. And Lord, that we can, by faith, believe it. We can receive it. Lord, what a joy that the Creator of the universe knows our heart. The Creator of the universe knows how to speak to us. Finite mortals. And that your word pierces our hearts. Your word goes through us. Your word causes us to think. Your word always remains true and it ever will be. Lord, I pray that as we look forward to these next few weeks looking at the the wisdom of the word and the work of the word, Lord, that we would never lose the wonder. Never lose the wonder that is the word of God. And that we would unashamedly let our lives be guided by it. That that we would unashamedly say that we do or don't do something because God's word says so. Because God and your words ought to guide our life. Lord, give us that boldness. Give us that courage that we would rest in your word and your word alone. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, we again always give you a chance to respond, whether it's a renewed love for the Word of God that you are feeling, whether it's understanding the joy that comes, the life that comes in placing your faith in the Word, Jesus Christ, what He did for you on the cross. I want to encourage you today that we would be a church, that we would be families, individuals, who have a love for the Word of God, not just in in word, Not just to say it, we all know what to say, but in deed, in action, that we would intentionally choose the Word of God over everything else and that we would be going to your Word in times of trouble, distress, peace, and prosperity and to see what your Word says to us today. So this morning, I want to encourage you today the Lord spoken to you, you can come and you can seek his face, pray to him and ask him to give you a renewed sense of peace, a renewed sense of awe at the word of God. However, the Lord spoken to you this morning, let me encourage you to do just that. So with your heads bowed and eyes closed, let's stand for a song of invitation. Miss Rhonda's going to play a couple verses, a couple notes today and meditate on that truth this morning. Don't lose the wonder. Don't lose the wonder that is the Word of God given to you. If He's spoken, it was. You can see and believe. You come this morning. Seek His face. I pray that you would help us today to never lose the wonder that is the Word of God, that we would never lose the joy of being able to see creation speak to your majesty, speak to your glory. Lord, regardless of the language we speak, your creation knows no bounds. And there is no speech or language where it is not heard. And Lord, help us to remember that the God of creation, the God of glory, sent His very Son, the Word of God, Jesus Christ, to this earth to pay for our sins. And Lord, for that we rejoice. We rejoice that we are forgiven. And Lord, as we come to You in faith, those who place their faith believe have have a home in heaven. Lord, what a joy to think about 
And it's all because of the power of the Word of God. Lord, help us not to lose the wonder. Help us to rely on that. Help us to cling to it in a world that, causes, that, that, that tries to get us to be ashamed of the Word, that tries to argue against the Word. Lord, your Word stands true. It has stood the test of time. It has stood against doubters in years past, and it will stand against doubters today. And Lord, because of that, we're thankful. Lord, help us to cast our lot, to cast our life on the promises and the truth of your word. Thank you for your word. Thank you for allowing us to be here today. I pray that you would give a special blessing, Lord, those who could not be with us, whether it's sickness or travel. I pray you give them safety. And Lord, bring us back safely tonight, Lord, as we again rejoice in uh, the living word, the living water that you've come to give. And so, Lord, we love you and ask your blessing on our church these next this week ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated just for a couple of quick moments. Uh, I'll share a couple things with you before we're dismissed. Uh, let me encourage you to make sure you check up the sign-up sheet. A lot of things happening, going on. Uh, we have, uh, as a church, we're heading to the Holocaust Museum down in Farmington Hills. Our missionary, Brother Ty Perry, is going to be coordinating that with us, and we're looking forward to it. Uh, I'll be sending an email out tomorrow uh, to those who are going, and so, or to probably everybody, but those who are going, take note. And uh, it'll be Thursday, of course, at noon is when everything starts. And I'll send the details out in the email. But spread the word. Make sure you know. Please let me know if there's somebody coming with you or you're bringing somebody so I can have that right number when I call on Wednesday uh, for Thursday. So make sure you're aware of that. And then it, it, I'm encouraging them to go out to eat, but I'll send that out in the email. Uh, we have a couple of Jewish delis that Brother Ty gave us, and so uh, we'll be, we'll be uh, using that. Also, I'd encourage you, please sign up. Uh, for a couple things, we have ladies game night coming up in a couple weeks. We also have uh, ladies softball. So if ladies, if you are uh, interested in, in playing softball, they need to know today. Uh, so that is a need. So, uh, I mean, it's a need. It's, it's a game. I get it. But uh, it's fun. But ladies, if you're interested, please sign up. Uh, we need to know or see Miss Becky. She can get you coordinated on those things. Uh, and then um, uh, Brazil will meet here after the service, after our closing song, choir tonight. And a couple activities, um, Shannon, am I, no, we're Shannon, what, but am I missing something? Oh, a military, military care pack, yeah, next week. Um, yeah, sack lunch Sunday. This is something new we're doing, a little different. Uh, we, are, we got with our missionary, the Baggetts, to the military. Uh, they go to uh, missions, they go to churches that are based out of, um, off, off base, near military bases, and they minister to churches and to servicemen and women. And uh, so sort of a combination. So next week is a little different. We're doing, uh, we're calling it Sack Lunch Sunday. So bring your sack lunch. And uh, we're going to stay after the service. And then after the service, we're going to go downstairs and uh, eat our lunches, have some time of fellowship. Brother Baggett has a, uh, a, a short video challenge for us, a word of encouragement. So we'll hear from him on video. And then we'll be packing five care packages for some in our own church and then some that they said could use some real encouragement. And so uh, we're going to be doing that in, in preparation for Armed Forces Day, which is May 18th. All right, so a little different, something different next Sunday. We're asking everyone to be involved. Uh, there'll be no evening service next Sunday night, so spread the word there. We're going to be all in here uh, just getting all these packed, and we're actually giving a chance to live out uh, the gospel, and we're going we're gonna to give them some resources, also some uh, special devotionals uh, for these men and women. So uh, be a part next week. It's going to be a great. We have uh, a, a box in the lobby, if you could. Uh, please make sure you ha we already have some donations in. We're looking for some more. And Shannon sent an email out with all that information. So uh, if you could be a help, that'd be awesome. So looking forward to next week. Don't forget um, for Sack Lunch Sunday. All right? I think that's all we have, Brother Jordan. And uh, visitors, we'll see you. Brazil team, will meet you down here and uh, see you tonight. All right, let's all stand together. We'll just sing the chorus. Make some praise,